What is the spirit of prophecy? Can we receive the gift? Quote, and the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. End quote. Revelation 12, 17, and Revelation 19, 10. Quote, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. End quote. Matthew eleven fifteen. Table of Contents. Introduction, page 1. The Spirit of Prophecy in the New Testament, page 5. The Spirit of Prophecy in the Old Testament, page 7. The Spirit of Prophecy by Example, page 9. Progressive Truth and Sanctification, page 16. Private Interpretation, page 22. Conclusion, page 24. Introduction. Within the revelation of Jesus Christ, Revelation 1, verses 1 through 2, we have placed before us the Spirit of Prophecy in order to discern the immense value of understanding the truth of this subject we will consider a brief point from revelation 12:17 in this verse we see mentioned a remnant the first definition of remnant in webster's 1828 dictionary is quote, residue that which is left after the separation removal or destruction of a part end quote this, along with all other definitions of the word, shows that a remnant is most definitely not the whole. The reason why this is so important is because only a remnant have this, quote, testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, end quote, Revelation 19.10. How zealous, then, we ought to be to have the testimony of Jesus, and how can we have this testimony if we don't even know what it is? One thing that stands out clearly is that this testimony is his, Jesus' testimony. Quote, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. End quote. Revelation 1. 1 through 2. What better way to learn what this testimony is than to learn it from the one whose testimony it is? We have already learned from comparing Revelation 12:17 with Revelation 19:10 that, quote, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, end quote. But now we must ask, what is the spirit of prophecy? Let scripture answer, quote, and I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. End quote. Revelation 19.10 quote, And I, John, saw these things, and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. End quote. Revelation 22, verses 8 through 9. Here are a few parallels in the above passages. Parallel 1. Revelation 19:10, And I fell at his feet to worship him. Revelation 22, 8 through 9. I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. Parallel 2. Revelation 19.10 He saith unto me, See thou do it not. Revelation 22.8-9 Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not. Parallel number 3. Revelation 19.10 I am thy fellow servant. Revelation 22.8-9 I am thy fellow servant. Parallel 4, Revelation 19.10, and of thy brethren, Revelation 22.8-9, and of thy brethren. Parallel number 5, Revelation 19.10, that have the testimony of Jesus, Revelation 22.8-9, the prophets. While this is not the end of the parallels in these passages, it is enough to illustrate the point. According to this, who are the brethren that have the testimony of Jesus? And what is the testimony of Jesus? Ah, there we have it. 
Those who have the spirit of prophecy are called, quote, prophets, end quote. Praise the Lord for the word of truth. This particular title, Spirit of Prophecy, is of course fitting since it is descriptive of what the Spirit does through the prophets, that is, prophesy. Quote, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. End quote. 2 Peter 1, 21. Now many have different ideas as to when the gift of the Spirit of Prophecy began and how long it will last. Some believe that this gift is only a latter-day manifestation of prophets in the church, while others hold that prophets ceased at the close of the New Testament scriptures. Still others contend that Malachi, John the Baptist, Jesus, or some other was the last true prophet. We must then look to the scriptures to find the truth amidst the rubble of private opinions on the subject. As we seek the Lord on these matters, we can be assured that He will reveal to us many more important truths, some relating to this subject and some as a result of understanding this subject. Before we go on with the many scriptures on the topic, let us define the word prophet. The Hebrew word for prophet is nabi, which means, quote, spokesman, end quote. Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew Definitions. This is from the root naba, which means, quote, to speak by inspiration, end quote, strongs. In other words, a prophet is someone who speaks on behalf of another through the method of inspiration. One may ask, why does God need a spokesperson? Can he not just communicate with each of us himself? This is a legitimate question, one whose answer is found in the beginning. In the beginning, God walked in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3.8, and spoke personally to Adam, Genesis 1.28. However, after they had sinned, mankind was driven from the Garden and was separated from God, Genesis 3.23-24. We were not, though, abandoned. Quote, and the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place." End quote. Second Chronicles 36, 15. Quote, I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way, and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them, and ye shall dwell in the land which I have given to you and to your fathers. But ye have not inclined your ear, nor hearkened unto me. End quote. Jeremiah thirty five fifteen. So it is out of love that God sends prophets. Soon after the fall, we already have rec record of prophets among the people of God. Quote, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. End quote. Jude one fourteen. Quote, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. End quote. Second Peter two verse five. Quote, now therefore restore the man his wife, for he, Abraham, is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, Know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. End quote. Genesis 20, verse 7. According to these passages, the spirit of prophecy was active in the days of Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and the line of prophets goes on and on. By the time we get to Moses, we see the Lord wanting to speak more directly to his people, but sadly they refuse him. Quote, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings, and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they were moved and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. End quote. Exodus 20, verses 18 through 19. So why is it that the people did not want to hear the Lord directly? Could it be because the Lord is a consuming fire? Deuteronomy 4:24 and in their sinful state they could not bear his presence? Are we today in any better a condition? 
And if the Lord should want to send us a message to help us out of this terrible state, how would he go about doing so? The Spirit of Prophecy in the New Testament Now that we see that the Spirit of Prophecy was around since the days of old, we shall turn to the New Testament prophets and see how long they say it will remain. Quote, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. End quote. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Quote, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Follow after charity, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy." End quote. 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 12, and 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Has that which is perfect come? Certainly not. Then if that is the truth, the spirit of prophecy must still be among us. Quote, and he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. End quote. Ephesians 4, 11-13 So there we have it. That which is perfect, 1 Corinthians 13, 9, is the, quote, perfect man, end quote, even Jesus Christ. Are we all come into the unity of the faith? Are we come into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? If we are not, then the spirit of prophecy must still be among us. Quote, I thank my God always on your behalf, for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. End quote. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 4 through 8. How different is the testimony of Scripture from the private ideas of men? It is no wonder, then, that we are told to, quote, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. End quote. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19-21 We are naturally told to prove all things for the reason that not all things are true. Christ himself said, quote, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. End quote. Matthew 24, verse 24. Where there is a false, there must be a true. Can the devil counterfeit something for which there is no truth? The Spirit of Prophecy in the Old Testament So far we have learned from the Scripture of Truth that the Spirit of Prophecy is the testimony of Jesus by the Holy Ghost and through the prophets in all generations from the beginning till the end. What we shall see in this section is the testimony of Jesus through the Old Testament prophets concerning the role of prophets, as well as the perpetuity and necessity of this gift. Quote, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. End quote. Amos 3, verse 7. From this key text, we not only learn that the role of prophets is to reveal the secret things of God, but also that the Lord will not do anything 
unless he reveals these secrets to his prophets. Stated another way, quote, if the Lord is doing anything, he will reveal it through his prophets, end quote. Or, quote, if the Lord is revealing anything through his prophets, he is doing something, end quote. Conversely, quote, if the Lord is not revealing anything through his prophets, he is doing nothing, end quote. For this reason, quote, where there is no vision, the people perish, end quote. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Therefore, when the Lord is speaking, we know he is acting. What a comfort and a cause for rejoicing. Quote, since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them, end quote. Jeremiah 7, verse 25, quote, Because they have not hearkened to my words, saith the Lord, which I sent unto them by my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them, but ye would not hear, saith the Lord, end quote. Jeremiah 29, verse 19, quote, I have sent also unto you all my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way, and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them. And ye shall dwell in the land which I have given to you and to your fathers. But ye have not inclined your ear, nor hearkened unto me. End quote. Jeremiah 35, verse 15. Quote, and they rose early in the morning, and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. End quote. Second Chronicles 20, verse 20. Quote, and the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. End quote. Second Chronicles 36, verses 15 through 17. The day that prophets cease from among us is the day that we perish for a lack of knowledge. Proverbs 29, 18, Hosea 4, 6. Indeed, it is by the prophets that the Lord speaks to us and thus preserves us. Quote, I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. And by a prophet the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet was he preserved. End quote. Hosea 12, verses 10 and 13. Quote, Therefore have I hewed them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth and thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth." End quote. Hosea 6, verse 5. We have now seen that the Lord speaking to us through his prophets is heaven's law and order. The Lord is very caring and wants to make sure there is no guesswork for those of us in the last days who may doubt this truth. For this reason he made sure to make specific prophecies in addition to the general principles in his word. Quote, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. End quote. Joel 2, verses 28 to 29. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. End quote. Malachi 3, verse 1. Quote, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet 
before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. End quote. Malachi 4, verse 5. The Spirit of Prophecy by Examples Now one says, I have the Spirit of Prophecy. It's right here in my Bible. That's all the prophets I need. Is that so? I suppose the Jews in the time of Christ could have easily said the same thing. I have the Torah and the prophets. What more could I need? While at the same time not realizing that they were, quote, wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, end quote, Revelation 3.17, and in need of everything the Lord has to offer. If having the Bible is having the spirit of prophecy, then why does Revelation 12.17 make a distinction between Christians who have the spirit of prophecy and those who do not? Don't all Christians have the Bible? Furthermore, if it was just the written word, then why is there need for anything beyond the writings of Moses? Yet he himself foretold of prophets to come, Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. We have also seen from the Bible that the spirit of prophecy started before the Bible and extends beyond the time of the Bible. What then makes the difference between having the spirit of prophecy and not having the spirit of prophecy? Let us see what the Bible has to say. In the days of Jacob and his son Joseph, both prophets, Israel prospered in the land of Goshen. After a time, though, they both died off and prophets ceased for a time among the children of Israel. As a result, the people perished, Proverbs 29:18, and suffered under the yoke of Pharaoh, Exodus 1, verse 11. In his great mercy, the Lord rose up a prophet named Moses, to deliver Israel out of Egypt and take them to the land that he promised their fathers. This story of perishing without prophets and deliverance with prophets is the story of God's people from beginning to end. In fact, one may ask if there was ever a time in the Bible where the people had a successful revival and reformation with no living prophets among them. As we continue, we shall see the answer. Let us start with the period just after Moses, namely the period of the Judges. Quote, and when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass, when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. End quote. Judges 2, verses 18 through 19. As we shall see, this was the pattern in the time of the judges, and yes, throughout time. Stage 1. Sin. Stage 2 bondage. Stage 3, crying out. Stage 4, profit. Stage 5, deliverance. Stage 6, prosperity. Stage 7, profit dies. Stage 8, sin. Note, as you read through the book of Judges, you will see that the judges are sometimes referred to as prophets, or it will say that the Spirit of the Lord came upon so and so. The question under consideration at the present is, at which point in this cycle is the spirit of prophecy made manifest and at which point does it become inactive? Othniel, quote, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam and the groves. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathaim, 
king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed against Cush and Rishathaim, and the land had rest forty years. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. End quote. Judges 3, verses 7 through 12. Ehud, quote, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed. And by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab, and the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. End quote. Judges 3, verse 12 and 15, and chapter 4, verse 1. Deborah. Quote, and the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Herosheth, of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had nine hundred chariots of iron, and twenty years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. So God subdued on that day Jabin the king of Canaan before the children of Israel, and the hand of the children of Israel prospered, and prevailed against Jabin the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin king of Canaan. Then sang Deborah and Barak the son of Abinoab on that day, saying, Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel, when the people willingly offered themselves. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. End quote. Judges 4, verses 1 through 4, and 23 through chapter 5, verses 2, and chapter 6, verse 1. Gideon, quote, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more. And the country was in quietness forty years in the days of Gideon. And it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went a-whoring after Balaam and made baal Berith their god. End quote. Judges chapter 6, verses 1 and 7 through 8. Chapter 8, verse 28 and verse 33. Jair, quote, and after him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years. And he had thirty sons that rode on thirty ass colts, and they had thirty cities, which are called Haveth Jair unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Camon. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam and Ashtaroth, and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Zidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord, and served him not. End quote. Judges 10, verses 3 through 6. Jephthah to Abdon. Quote, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam, and Ashtaroth, and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Zidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord, and served him not. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, 
and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah the Gileadite, and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. And after him Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. And he had thirty sons and thirty daughters, whom he sent abroad, and took in thirty daughters from abroad for his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. Then died Ibzan, and was buried at Bethlehem. And after him Elon, a Zebulonite, judged Israel. And he judged Israel ten years. And Elon, the Zebulonite, died, and was buried in Ajalon, in this country of Zebulun. And after him Abdon, the son of Hillel, a Pirithonite, judged Israel, and he had forty sons and thirty nephews that rode on threescore and ten ass colts, and he judged Israel eight years. And Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pirithonite, died, and was buried in Pirithon and in the land of Ephraim, in the mount of the Amalekites. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. End quote. Judges chapter 6, verses 6 through 7, chapter 11, verse 29, chapter 12, verses 7 through chapter 13, verse 1. Samuel, quote, And Samuel spake unto the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth, and served the Lord only. So the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more into the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him, and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shinem. And Saul gathered all Israel together. And they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. End quote. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 3 through 4 and 13, and chapter 28, verses 3 through 7. This same pattern is also seen with the prophets after the judges, Zechariah and Haggai. Quote, then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. End quote. Ezra 4, verse 24. Quote, in the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo the prophet, saying, Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? End quote. Zechariah 1, verses 1 and 5. Quote, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. End quote. Haggai 1, verses 1 and 12. Quote, then the prophets, Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Yeshua, the son of Josedach, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. 
End quote. Ezra chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Well, at which time was the spirit of prophecy made manifest in all these examples? When did the spirit of prophecy again become inactive, no longer manifest? I'm sure you can see it was when the Lord raised up the prophet that it was manifested, and when the prophet died that it became inactive. Can we honestly and scripturally say that the spirit of prophecy is a book or books of ink and paper? Can we see that it is anything but what it is in truth? So then, according to the scriptures, what does it mean to have the spirit of prophecy? Simply this. To have the spirit of prophecy is to have Jesus giving his testimony by the Holy Ghost through a living prophet. Progressive Truth and Sanctification The fact that the Bible teaches that we are to expect more prophets is letting us know that God has more to say to us. Quote, But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. End quote. Proverbs 4.18 In some of the previously quoted scriptures, we saw the purpose for the gift of prophecy in the church laid out. Please notice the following stated purposes. Quote, and he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. End quote. Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13. Quote, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. End quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. The coming to fruition of these things is also called sanctification in the scriptures. Quote, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. End quote. Acts 26, verse 18. Quote, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. End quote. Romans 10, verse 17. Since we are sanctified by faith, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word, and since the word of God comes through prophets, it is easy to see how the spirit of prophecy, being active in the church, has a direct and inseparable connection to perfecting the saints, coming into unity, sanctification, and all things resulting therefrom. This truly is, quote, the everlasting gospel, end quote. Revelation 14, 6. And what is the gospel? Quote, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, end quote. Romans 1, verse 16. How is the power of God revealed? Quote, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. End quote. Romans 1, verse 20. The truth that the power of God in relation to faith is revealed in creation is also spoken of in the epistle to the Hebrews. Quote, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. End quote. Hebrews 3, verses 1 through 3. 
We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God because God speaks and it is so. Quote, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. End quote. Genesis 1, 3. Quote, for he spake and it was done, he commanded and it stood fast. End quote. Psalms 33, verse 9. Quote, and behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. End quote. Matthew 8, verses 2 to 3. Quote, and when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. End quote. Matthew 8, verses 5 through 11, and verse 13. What we are seeing is that the word of God is not at all like the word of man. God, quote, calleth those things which be not as though they were, end quote, Romans 4, 17. If a man does this, he is a liar. But when God does this, he is the creator in the very act of creating. The reason for this is that it is impossible for God to lie, Titus 1, verses 1 through 2, Hebrews 6, verses 17 through 18. So when he speaks of those things which are not as though they were, they are. Quote, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. End quote. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. To emphasize the point, it is the word of God itself which does the work. So why is this important in regards to the subject of the spirit of prophecy? Just this, we are sanctified, made righteous, by faith, Hebrews 11, 7. And faith is believing in the word of God and depending on the word itself to do that which it says. And since the word of God always comes through the spirit of prophecy, when we cut off the spirit, we cut off the word and thus faith and righteousness, and are then left in our sins as that which is not of faith is sin. Romans 14, 23. What a dark, miserable, and hopeless condition. But that is not what we want. We want the righteousness of Christ. And what is the righteousness of Christ? Quote, O oh, my people, remember now what Balak king of Moab consulted, and what Balaam the son of Beor answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. End quote. Micah 6, verse 5. Quote, and Balak said unto him, What hath the Lord spoken? And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? End quote. Numbers 23, verse 19. The righteousness of the Lord is his inability to lie. In other words, it is his truth, his word, his law. Psalms 119, 172, Isaiah 51, 6 through 7, 1 John 5, 17, and 3, verse 4. They are spirit, Revelation 19, 10. They are life, John 6, 63. What stark contrast between the word of God and the word of man. Quote, for Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. 
I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. End quote. Isaiah 62, verses 1 and 6. To, quote, hold your peace, end quote, is to be silent. Here, though, God says that he will not hold his peace. He will continue to speak. Why? So that our righteousness, Christ's righteousness, will go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. To obtain a better understanding of this verse, we'll take a quick look at Matthew 25. This chapter contains the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five of whom were foolish. The five wise virgins had oil in their vessels as well as in their lamps, Matthew 25, 4, whereas the foolish only had oil in their lamps. Without going into much detail, we can see that the oil represents the spirit slash truth, 1 Samuel 16, 13, 1 John 5, 6. The oil in the lamps is the oil, truth, presently burning, presently lighting our way, whereas the oil in the vessels represents truth in reserve, which is to lighten our way at some future point. Bringing this back into the context of Isaiah 62, 1, we see that the Lord will continue to speak to us so that we will always have present truth, quote, as a lamp that burneth, end quote. Quote, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth, end quote. Second Peter 1, verse 12. There is such a thing as, quote, present truth, end quote, and it's about time we all know what it is. And how are we to know, save through the very method the Lord has used from the beginning, the spirit of prophecy? When we come to the place of realizing and admitting that we have repeated the errors of our forefathers and have done only that which is right in our own eyes, Judges 17, 6, that we truly are, quote, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, end quote, Revelation 3, 17, and in need of everything, then and only then will we exchange our righteousness for Christ's righteousness, our word for his word, and our fables for his ever-progressing truth. As we move forward in the truth, we see more and more of the righteousness of Christ. Truth is what defines right and wrong for us and enables us to live in harmony with the law of God. Here is a little illustration to demonstrate the point. Suppose there was a man that lived a gluttonous life, but did not know that it was wrong to do so. When this man comes to the faith and hears the truth that gluttony is sin, the word then works in his life to free him of his sin, and he then lives in harmony with the will of God. So what was it that made the change? Was it not the word of truth? Now suppose this man should run out of truth, what would he then have to bring him more into the image of God? But you see, with an ever unfolding, ever progressive truth, this man will never cease to be made more into the image of God. This is why it is so important to have the living spirit of prophecy active in our midst. This is how we exchange our filthy rags for his beautiful garments, Isaiah 52, 1. Quote, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. End quote. 
Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 11. When we heed the above counsel and receive the straight testimony of the true witness, when we receive the correct understanding of the spirit of prophecy, then we will see that our own righteousness is as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6, and we will finally be saved from our private opinions of what constitutes truth. Private Interpretation Quote, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. End quote. 2 Peter 1, verses 19 through 21. It goes by without much notice, but private interpretation is the one sin above all others in the church that perpetuates unrighteousness. Why is this? By beholding we become changed. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Therefore, if we are beholding a perversion of the truth rather than the truth itself, we become changed into that image. Our conception of truth, and thus righteousness, will define who we are and what decisions we make. Praise the Lord that He has decided to continue to send us His truth revealed through His prophets, Amos 3.7, so that we are not left to our own private opinions. Quote, and they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. End quote. Genesis 40, verse 8. Some feel that we should all be able to interpret the Bible as we please, but, quote, Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? End quote. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 29. We have all been given different roles in the church. One major aspect of a prophet's role is to reveal the hidden things of God, Amos 3, verse 7. Should we follow our own devising, or should we follow the word of the Lord through the spirit of prophecy? Consider the following passages. Quote, Produce your cause, saith the Lord, Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring them forth, and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things what they be, that we may consider them, and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Yea, do good, or do evil, that we may be dismayed, and behold it together. Behold, ye are of nothing, and your work of naught. An abomination is he that chooses you. I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come. From the rising of the sun shall he call upon my name. And he shall come upon princes as upon mortar, and as the potter treadeth clay. Who hath declared from the beginning that we may know, and before time that we may say, He is righteous? Yea, there is none that showeth. Yea, there is none that declareth. Yea, there is none that heareth your words. The first shall say to Zion, Behold, behold them, and I will give to Jerusalem one that bringeth good tidings. For I beheld, and there was no man, even among them, and there was no counselor, that, when I asked of them, could answer a word. Behold, they are all vanity, their works are nothing, their molten images are wind and confusion. End quote. Isaiah 41, verses 21 through 29. Quote, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. End quote. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Quote, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. End quote. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Conclusions thus far. The preceding information can be summarized in the following points. Number one, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Number two, the spirit of prophecy was in existence 
from the gates of Eden and will continue on until the second coming of Christ. Number three, heaven's law and order is for God to speak through prophets. Number four, without living prophets, God's people perish. Number five, we are sanctified by truth, and thus the continual unfolding of truth through the spirit of prophecy is the method through which God designs to bring us to perfection. Number six, interpretations belong to God who reveals his secrets through his servants, the prophets. All of this leads us to the answer of our initial question, what is the spirit of prophecy? Number seven, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus by the Holy Ghost and through a living prophet, or the Holy Ghost speaking through a living prophet. Now the decision is up to you. Will you receive the love of the truth, or will you turn a blind eye to the plain word of God? Quote, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. End quote. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Quote, and this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. End quote. John 3, 19. Quote, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. End quote. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 12. Quote, Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy, and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. End quote. Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 3. That we may all come into, quote, the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. End quote. Ephesians 4, verse 13. By Trent Wilde, The Branch. Website www.the-branch.org.